thanks to Fabulous for helping support this episode. Hey crazies, capacitors make no sense. They're tiny physical gaps in a circuit. They shouldn't even work, but they do work, somehow. In fact, if we analyze capacitors on a deep level, we see they're almost breathing energy. Before we start discussing abstract things like energy, I wanna make sure we understand the tangible stuff first. Capacitors come in a wide variety of shapes and sizes and are made from a wide variety of materials. But all of them are designed to make use of a gap in a wire. The most basic design for a capacitor is two metal plates separated by an air gap. In practice though, the gap is usually filled with a solid material called a dielectric. Wouldn't that close the gap though? Actually, no, it's still a gap because dielectrics are insulators. Th then why even include them? A few reasons. First, the metal plates are gonna build up opposite electric charges. Opposite charges tend to attract. The dielectric holds the plates apart. That means we can put the plates closer together if we want to. Second, anything can become a conductor with enough voltage, including air. Dielectrics tend to be better insulators than air, so they help prevent sparks. And third, uh, the third reason comes down to how capacitors work. The simplest circuit looks something like this. A battery, a light bulb, and a couple of wires. If they're connected to form a closed loop, then charges have a place to go. That flow is seen as an electric current through the circuit. The, the charge, charge must flow. But if there's a gap, charges don't have a place to go, which means there isn't a current, right? Well, not so fast. We might like our physical rules to be simple, but as John Green would say, the truth resists simplicity. Whether or not a gap stops an electric current depends on the size of the gap. We're all pretty sure a big open switch would prevent it, but the distance between atoms in a wire is also technically a gap. No one ever worries about those tiny gaps preventing a current. The gap in a well-designed capacitor is on the order of a micrometer, give or take. That's a thousand times bigger than atomic spacing, but a thousand times smaller than an open switch. It's in that vague gray area in between. It is a big enough gap to break the circuit, but not immediately. Most of our instincts about electric circuits are based on how they work once they've settled into something we call the steady state. In that state, the capacitor is definitely a break in the circuit at least when the circuit is DC, like all our examples so far in this video. But there's a short time at the beginning when you first turn on the circuit, when its behavior won't necessarily match our intuitions. That's the transient state of the circuit. This is the state where the capacitor shines. I mean, metaphorically, not literally. If your capacitor is literally shining, you're having a bad day. Anyway, the transient state of the circuit doesn't usually last very long. If all you've got is a light bulb and a battery, it only lasts a tiny fraction of a second. Fast, fast! But a capacitor could extend that time dramatically. The transient state could easily last a few seconds. It's still a gap though, isn't it? Yeah, and that's the whole point. Imagine you've got a battery, a capacitor, a few wires, and a switch to turn things on and off. The battery is fully energized, so there's a voltage between the two ends. Voltage is related to energy, so we're starting to get a little abstract here. Just remember that an energy difference or a gradient is what allows stuff to happen. All hail the gradients! When a battery has a voltage, that just means it can do stuff, given the opportunity. That's all that matters right now. With the switch open, that voltage doesn't have an opportunity to do anything. When we flip it closed, everything changes, but not right away. At first, there's no voltage across the capacitor. Wait, that can't be right. Voltage is what allows circuit stuff to happen. If there's no voltage across the capacitor, then nothing should happen inside the capacitor. Uh, ho hold on. This can't be right. What am I doing wrong? Okay, 
I am right, but there's a subtle nuance I need to explain. Conservation of energy dictates that whatever the battery puts in, the rest of the circuit takes out. Conservation of energy shall not be violated. In a circuit, we account for that with voltage. But the voltage drop across the capacitor is not necessarily equal to the voltage added by the battery. It's very common to assume these wires have exactly zero resistance. As Electroboom would say, They are magic wires. In reality though, they're not zero resistance. No material is exactly zero resistance. Not even superconductors, don't at me. We only ignore wire resistance when there are larger sources of resistance. When there aren't larger sources, we have to include the wire resistance. There's no choice, which means there are actually two places voltage can drop, across the capacitor or across the wires. When we first flip the switch closed, there's no charge buildup on the plates, so this is zero. There is a voltage applied to the capacitor, but all the voltage is dropped across the wires. Over time though, charge builds up and the capacitor takes over. Once it completely takes over, the circuit is broken. Essentially, the capacitor has its own voltage now that perfectly cancels the driving voltage from the battery. With no overall energy gradient, nothing can happen. The electric current stops. It behaves exactly how you'd expect a gap to behave. It has reached steady state. The entire charging process before that was the transient state. With these low resistance wires, it only lasted a few microseconds. Fast, fast! But if we put a larger resistor in there, it could easily last milliseconds or even whole seconds. Except it wouldn't have charged at all if there wasn't an electric current, right? Correct. How is there an electric current across an insulating gap? Oh, it, it, it doesn't, but we get a current on either side of the gap anyway. If it helps, you can imagine there's a current in there, even though there isn't. We've been avoiding talking about fields so far, but we can't anymore. The behavior of electric charge is inherently linked to the behavior of the electromagnetic field. This field usually carries a value of zero, but that all changes when electric charges are around. You get a non-zero electric field by default, but you get a non-zero magnetic field if the charges move around. These two fields are often considered one thing, the electromagnetic field. It surrounds us and penetrates us, but it doesn't really bind the galaxy together. It is super important for circuits though. For example, if there's a changing electric field across the gap in a capacitor, it'll behave a lot like an electric current. The resemblance is so uncanny that we refer to that changing field as a displacement current. But to understand how this works, the water analogy might be helpful. A battery is kind of like a water pump. It's not the source of the water, it's the reason the water moves. A capacitor would be like a chamber with a rubber diaphragm in the middle. Water can't pass through it, but the diaphragm is flexible. If the pump is on, it's gonna push water into the diaphragm. As the diaphragm deforms, it pushes water on the other side. Even though the water can't pass through the diaphragm, it still moves on both sides, at least until the diaphragm is against the wall of the chamber. That's when the flow stops. A similar thing happens inside a capacitor. As electric charge builds up on the positive plate, an electric field grows inside the gap. That field pushes charge on the other plate, causing a current on the other side of the capacitor. Even though no charge actually jumps the gap, it still flows on both sides. Now, this visual may be fairly accurate, but it isn't always necessary. It's a lot easier to step up a level of abstraction. Instead of imagining a changing electric field inside the gap, why don't we just imagine an electric current in there? Mathematically, that's pretty easy to do. This stuff in Ampere's law just becomes a secondary current, the displacement current. We simply swap the field out for an imaginary current and move on. If all you care about is the flow of charge, that's plenty good enough. If you care about where the energy is, well, that's where the field matters. Most of the time, it doesn't matter how energy moves in a circuit. All that matters is that it starts at some source like a battery and gets to where you want it to go. That's why what I'm about to tell you doesn't usually get taught in electrical engineering courses. But I'm a theoretical physicist. Physic phys physicist. Physicist. I'm a physicist. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I know things. But I'm a theoretical physicist, not an engineer. So practical schmactical. Let's go for the deeper understanding. We like to think a battery provides some energy to a charged particle. Then that particle carries the energy around to wherever it's needed. 
Energy is provided to charges over and over again until the battery runs out of energy or the bulb is turned off. It's a nice simple visual and it might be fine for an electrical engineer, but fundamentally it's wrong. The energy isn't provided to the particle at all. Yes, there are positive particles flowing around. There is an electric current. It's just that the energy in this electric current isn't what the circuit uses to do its thing. The particles certainly have kinetic energy, but that kinetic energy isn't what the circuit uses. Those charges don't slow down. Once they settle into a steady flow, that's their speed all the way around. The current at different spots in a circuit is determined by how many charges are there, not their speed. The energy the circuit uses to do whatever it does is carried by the fields around the circuit. When we're done here, you can check out this video from a few years ago if you want a full explanation, but here's the quickie version. The flow of energy in the electromagnetic field is described by the pointing vector. As you can see, the electric field and the magnetic field are both involved. You need both or there's no energy flow. This equation tells us two important bits of information. One, the energy flowing through a specific point is proportional to the field strengths at that point. And two, the direction of that flow is perpendicular to both fields. In the simple battery light bulb circuit, that means the energy flows kind of like this. It comes out of the battery into the surrounding field and then flows through the field to its destination. What's that look like for a capacitor? I'm so glad you asked. It looks like this. For real? For real. Allow me to explain. Earlier, we saw what the electric field looks like inside a capacitor, but here's the magnetic field. It wraps around any current in the circuit, including the displacement current in the gap. Remember that displacement current? It's still a useful abstraction. The pointing vector says the flow of energy is always perpendicular to both fields. That means it points into the gap from outside. As the plates charge up, energy flows into the capacitor like this. Once it's fully charged, the current stops which means no more magnetic field, which means no more pointing vector, which means no more energy flow. The capacitor is holding all the energy it can at this moment. If the current is alternating, the charge-discharge cycle will repeat. It almost looks like the capacitor is breathing. Capacitors are so cool. They're a device designed to use a gap in a circuit. Air gap capacitors do exist, but they're usually filled with some kind of solid insulator. As the plates charge up, an electric field grows inside that behaves a lot like an electric current. That current causes a magnetic field to form and ultimately allows energy to flow. Mind you, energy is also kind of an abstraction. That means energy flowing inside fields is an abstraction inside of another abstraction, but it's really beautiful to look at, isn't it? So, what do you think of capacitors now? Please share in the comments. Thanks for liking and sharing this video. A special thanks goes out to all my Patreon patrons and YouTube members for making all this possible. Don't forget to subscribe if you'd like to keep up with us. And until next time, remember, it's okay to be a little crazy. Thanks again to Fabulous, the number one self-care app to help you build better habits and achieve your goals. Do you have any good habits you wanna start or bad habits you wanna stop? Fabulous can help with that. Self-improvement, mental health, physical health, mindfulness, really whatever habit you're looking for. It can be 100% personalized for you and your needs. Maybe you wanna drink more water or start doing stretches every morning. Maybe you just wanna set some time aside for reading or meditation. My wife has been using it for exercise and food-related habits. Fabulous does track your habits, but it's more than just a habit tracker. It's actually based on studies done in behavioral science. If you want or need a self-guided experience, that's fine. If socializing with other motivated people helps you, there are features for that too. There's even a built-in digital coach to keep you motivated every day. If you're interested, go to the link in the description below. The first 100 people to click the link will get 25% off a Fabulous Premium subscription. It'll also let Fabulous know you heard about them from me, which helps out the channel. Many of you were wondering what exactly negative roughness means. I avoided the negative states on purpose because they don't really matter unless there's interference. Without interference, they behave just like their positive counterparts. Anyway, thanks for watching.